Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me this morning. Uh, my name is Tatiana Jameson. I'm a software architect with Jaguar Land Rover here in Portland. I'm part of the Open Software Technology Center. Uh, we work primarily on in-vehicle infotainment platforms, but we're also really interested in technologies connecting to IVI systems. And of course, right at the forefront of that is the connected car. Uh, Jaguar Land Rover, and I, through Jaguar Land Rover, am a member of uh, the open source uh, standards development organization, Genevi. How many of you have heard of Genevi? A handful. I'm not talking about the debugger. Some of you might hear that and think that sounds a lot like GDB. Um, we are also part of a Linux Foundation a project called Automotive Grade Linux. How many of you have heard of Automotive Grade Linux? All right, about the same. So as everyone knows, connected cars, probably going to be vulnerable. They're connected to the network. Everything that's connected to a network can be vulnerable. I want to start out by saying, uh, like any security talk, uh, nothing in this talk is going to provide bulletproof security. Nothing can completely uh, uh, eliminate the possibility of any vulnerabilities or any exploits. Instead, uh, what we're trying to do is mitigate uh, uh, security vulnerabilities by making the cost of exploiting those vulnerabilities higher than the rewards. Now, obviously, at Jaguar Land Rover, we have a, a pretty high incentive. A lot of uh, automotive manufacturers are concerned about security. Uh, but as a luxury automaker, uh, I mean, who wouldn't want to steal a Jaguar if they could do it for a low enough cost, you know? On top of that, uh, Jaguar and Land Rover pr provide the fleet vehicles for uh, the royal families of England, Scotland, and Wales. So we have, we have a lot of business uh, motivation to be concerned about security. And you probably, but just by showing up to this talk, you probably know everyone's talking about car hacking. Back in 2015, uh, security researchers uh, Charlie Miller and uh, Chris Valasek uh, identified a method for exploiting an unaltered uh, Jeep Grand Cherokee. Uh, that, as a direct result of that exploit, 1.4 million Fiat Chrysler vehicles were recalled. They had to be recalled into dealerships or uh, repair facilities because there were no facilities for over-the-air upgrades. When Miller and Valasek, uh, how many of you are familiar with this exploit, first of all? Well, most of you. Have any of you read the white paper on this exploit? A couple, uh, okay. When Miller and Valasek were doing their initial exploratory work, uh, they uh, had done a lot of work uh, trying to find exploits on any unaltered uh, passenger vehicle. They'd spent years and years doing this. They'd built on academic researchers' work. Uh, what they found was uh, that there was a way to get a backdoor into a Sprint uh, cell cellular uh, phone network and uh, get access to any vehicles that were connected to the Sprint cellular towers for data uh, through that, uh, that device that allowed them to connect to the Sprint network. And once they had a telnet connection, an unsecured telnet connection to the vehicle, they were able to uh, access uh, DBUS, which is the inter-process communication method that's used on the vehicle. When they did their initial scans, what they were trying to find this particular vehicle that they were targeting. They found over 2,500 vehicles. They had to filter out the list of responses just to be able to find the vehicle that they were targeting so that when they cut the brakes on this particular vehicle with a, a reporter behind the wheel, they knew that they were doing it to this vehicle and not to some unsuspecting person's vehicle. They did a lot of uh, control things uh, through the DBOS before they actually uh, cut the brakes by uh, changing uh, HVAC control, changing the radio station, all kinds of things. <clears throat> Tesla, in 2016, uh, was hit by a number of exploits. Tesla is a very uh, juicy target for security researchers because it's so high profile. In early 2016, some security researchers identified that there was a possibility of an exploit uh, 
by accessing a malicious uh, wireless network on the, the in-car browser, but that particular exploit required physical access to the vehicle. In September, Chinese security researchers Keen Security Labs identified a, a possible exploit that did not require physical access to the vehicle. All it required was that the driver of the vehicle access a malicious Wi-Fi network. In November, Promon uh, AS, a Norwegian security research group, announced another remote exploit. This was through a malicious uh, Wi-Fi network that the driver connected to and downloaded a malicious app on their Android phone. Now, this isn't a security exploit that's directly on the Tesla platform. This security exploit is entirely through the Android uh, model and the Android security model. But nevertheless, it was an exploit that allowed the researchers to uh, steal the owner's uh, uh, authentication credentials so that they could steal the car, they could track the car remotely, uh, they could have control over the car. As many of you know, automotive software architecture is very, very complex. It's also made up by a lot of black boxes, a lot of proprietary black boxes. Uh, some recent uh, uh, publications indicated that a typical luxury vehicle has about 100 million lines of code. That's more than the entire code base for Facebook and Windows Vista combined. And I'm sure we all have some thoughts about Windows Vista and code bloat. Uh, and on, uh, the internal network of a car has to control all of these features. An internal network is a, a mixed assurance system. That means that many, many, many of these features are safety critical features. Of course, the brakes, the transmission, all of the stuff that you would normally expect a car to do at its base are all safety critical features. But then there are also pieces of software running in a car that maybe you might think aren't so safety critical. A radio is probably not safety critical, right? A CD player might not be safety critical. And yet most of those systems do have some manner of it communicating with other parts of the internal uh, system network. And so uh, there is a, an issue of access control. When you add uh, the additional component of interacting with remote services uh, and remote devices, then that infrastructure becomes even more complex. This is from uh, Craig Smith's uh, Car Hacker's Handbook. It's a, a, this is the 2014 publication, which is freely available. Uh, Craig Smith also published an updated version in 2016 following the uh, FCA exploit. I definitely recommend reading both the Illmatics paper and uh, Craig Smith's work if this is a topic you're interested in, by the way. And of course, one of the, for every line that we have represented here, this is, a, uh, this is an example of something that crosses trust boundaries. If you're familiar with uh, security in embedded systems, we already know that there's uh, the, the trust boundary of uh, kernel space versus user space. It's why we have uh, user accounts versus root accounts and uh, other privilege access, uh, other access control in any sort of Linux system. When you, are having, when you have uh, a Anything crossing a trust boundary, that is a potential attack surface. And there needs to be some plan for a mitigation in place. Geneva, as a standards development organization, is interested in uh, identifying standards for uh, automotive to adopt. Uh, and you don't need to be a Geneva member to adopt these standards. Anyone can, can adopt them pretty freely. <clears throat> The primary project that Geneva has, is sponsoring for this is called Remote Vehicle Interaction, or RVI. And RVI is a form of middleware for service-oriented architecture, which should be pretty familiar from uh, many other applications in Internet of Things or system architecture. Uh, the 
A vehicle may want to connect to a mobile device. It may want to connect to a driver's smartwatch, a passenger's smartwatch. May also need to connect to a backend cloud, and that might be a billing service from the OEM. Uh, it might be somebody wants to uh, stream Spotify in their car. <clears throat> the uh, motivation between behind RBI is that it is a small shim layer that abstracts whatever network protocol you might be running on your device. It adds some access control uh, layers, uh, which are enforced through the JSON web token standards. So these are self-carried credentials. And when a connection is initiated, uh, both endpoints on the connection uh, send along their credentials uh, to inform the other person, here's what I have ac access to. Everything is based on public key infrastructure, uh, and it's all API-based. So the, here is a more detailed view of uh, the architecture. So the vehicle uh, will have its IVI platform. It will have some number of apps running on top of that IVI platform. That IVI platform will communicate with an RBI plugin which is through a, a well-known standard of JSON. Uh, we can also use a message pack in some cases, or BSON, if, if we uh, need to compress the, the data. But we use JSON for a proof of concept because it's a really well-known uh, data format. The data router uh, is also responsible for uh, handling routing on the vehicle to other parts of the internal vehicle network, aside from uh, the IVI platform. If there's the, the CAN bus, any ECU control that might be available. The data router is available, uh, is the common piece among all pieces, all parts of the, the architecture, whether that's the mobile device, a smartwatch, uh, a cloud device. And like I said before, it's a, it's a shim layer. Uh, the data router itself is the uh, component that Genevi has been developing for several years. Uh, we, have, we have been doing demos uh, for it uh, for at least two years that I know of. I started with Jaguar Land Rover in January of 2016. And uh, we're currently on version 0.5.0 for uh, RVI Core, which is our primary uh, proof of concept implementation. It's based on Erlang. Uh, we also have SDKs available for iOS and Android development. And we've done demo applications, demos uh, using RVI at, uh, Geneva, at least the Geneva All Members meetings uh, for at least the last four, probably longer. We also, as of new as of last year, have a C library uh, that uh, is a limited implementation of uh, the RVI architecture so that if you would like to uh, have this behavior on a, an embedded device, for example, then uh, you have a behavior that's a little bit more like this, so that you don't have to bring in the full Erlang stack uh, in order to run RBI. Uh, all of these implementations are available on GitHub. They're available for free. Uh, you don't need to have, uh, you don't need to be a member of Geneva to use them. You don't even need to have a car to use them. Uh, you can run them on, on your platform, on your, your desktop environment platform. Uh, because Geneva is a, a Linux-focused uh, organization, we do most of our development on Linux. And so most of the testing that we do and the continuous integration pipelines that we do are all uh, done on Ubuntu or another x86 uh, Linux architecture. Uh, so when I w am working on it, I prefer to work on it in a virtual machine, but uh, you, there's, there's lots of options. <clears throat> well, there are, if you've attended any of the other talks here this week, you've probably uh, heard some other talks uh, about IoT and messaging uh, 
platform or messaging uh, protocols. So I attended a talk on uh, DPS for IoT. Uh, it's a distributed publish, sub uh, publish subscribe model for Internet of Things. Uh, that definitely has some, some commonality with RBI. Uh, I also attended a talk on Leota, uh, which has, again, some commonality. They're, they're definitely operating in a similar uh, space. One of the things uh, that is motivating us for RBI is we want to keep it completely open source, and we want to make sure that the licensing is very permissive so that uh, commercial uh, implementers can integrate it into their own platform without, uh, without uh, licensing difficulties. So that's a MPL version 2.0 license. The flip side of that is we don't really know what uptake is yet. Uh, we know that we have uh, other Genevi members and people outside of Genevi organizations who have uh, emailed us about uh, issues that they've run into or feature requests. We've uh, had ongoing conversations with uh, IOTivity and the Open Connectivity Foundation about uh, working with RVI. But ultimately, we don't know what the uptake is. Yes? The relationship between this and the, uh, uh, advanced telematics. Ah, so uh, advanced telematics is, uh, did a reference implementation for software over the air and firmware over the air with uh, Genevi. Uh, we have been working pretty closely with advanced telematics. Uh, so that uh, Soda Photo is part of the overarching uh, project concept for RVI. RVI consists of, the, the project charter consists of three major areas. It's control, uh, software over the air, and big data, so that's metrics. Uh, as I understand it, the uh, current impl reference implementation that ATS has for their SOTA platform uh, does not use the specific uh, RVI, the specific Erlang RVI implementation, but that is a planned uh, modification. Uh, the C library, in fact, was uh, developed in response to an ask from ATS to have a lightweight client that did not require the full Erlang stack. Yes? So uh, right now, uh, RVI Lib, that's the, the C library implementation, is currently the only one that is under review for compliance with Genevi. Right now, that is a platform compliance proposal. So our target uh, in the short term is to get that incorporated into the Genevi development platform to uh, give it some more time to uh, mature and identify uh, how people are using it and what features may need to be added for a production release. Uh, the, the, Erlang is how, the Erlang implementation, however, is the implementation where it's likeliest that new features will be introduced first. Does that help? Uh, yeah, I realized I forgot to repeat the question. So the, the question was, uh, so basically the spec is solid, but uh, there, are there any open source known production ready implementations for it? And I would say that uh, the Erlang implementation is the most mature, but uh, as a developer on the project, I would not feel comfortable putting any in production just yet. <laughs> yes? The spec is open. Uh, it's available both on the uh, GitHub uh, repo. The high-level definition document is available in the uh, RVI core repo. There are links to it from uh, the other RVI repos as well. Uh, and it's also available uh, through the Genevi Projects wiki. Uh, and I'll have a link to that right at the end. Uh, so the primary piece of the, the 
primary motivation uh, for the, the spec is to define the data router uh, and the protocol of how, uh, the, how uh, messages look when they're being transferred over the air, so, as well as the connection protocol. Um, unfortunately, I don't think I included those particular slides in this slide deck. Uh, I didn't want to get uh, too much into a deep dive, given the, the time limitations. Uh, but uh, let me see. Okay, we have uh, we have some information right here about uh, how an application will look. So this is this is roughly how uh, a, a southbound uh, API message would be. So southbound would be from the data router to the application on a device. And northbound would be from the device up to the cloud. So uh, this is a pretty simple JSON uh, message. It asks for a method. Uh, it asks for a service name. One of the pieces that the spec defines is the concept of fully qualified service names. And if you're familiar with MQTT, it's going to be a fairly similar concept. It has topics, it has delimiters uh, using the, the forward slash, just like in MQTT. Uh, access control is based on wildcarding mod modeled after uh, the uh, MQT specif MQTT specification. Uh, a fully qualified service name will always include a domain. Uh, it will include a device type, the UUID, and then some subtopics, uh, which might be control subtopics or it might be uh, topic names uh, for metrics and so on. Uh, a method invocation can also include param parameters, which is just a simple JSON object. Uh, and the data router uh, takes that, that JSON request that's come in, identifies, uh, based on the service, a routing method to forward it to, if that service is still available, if a connection is still live. If the connection is not still live, it will hold that message until a, a timeout occurs. And I see that there isn't a, a timeout specified in this particular callback. There are some default values that are specified or a, a, an application can specify a, t a timeout directly. And if a, a connection makes that service available before the timeout occurs, then it will route that message, uh, route the invocation to the correct service. So it will hold it in a buffer. <coughs> This is a way to handle sparse connectivity. A car obviously isn't always going to be connected to the internet. Uh, and also uh, uh, supports uh, multiple types of routes that might be possible. So uh, if your car, if you're uh, driving down the road and uh, you're in a good cellular network, uh, it might be fine to stream, uh, stream information from Spotify to play your music. But if you're parked in a garage and you've got your phone, you've got a, a mobile unlock on your phone, you don't want to have to have access to a backend server in order to be able to unlock your phone if you've previously authenticated. And so uh, part of the spec is uh, supporting multiple data link layers, and that's uh, Bluetooth. Uh, it includes some, we've, we've done some uh, proof of concept on uh, SMS using like wake up SMSs over RVI. Uh, actually invoking services over SMS is not, uh, not often uh, very successful because it's uh, not a particularly reliable method. Uh, it does, SMS doesn't guarantee delivery at all. It doesn't guarantee that the delivery will occur only once. It doesn't guarantee delivery within a particular time frame or not at all. So there's, uh, there are def definitely some perks to offering SMS, uh, but also some limitations. The uh, specification does uh, uh, specify a variety of security features. Uh, 
in general, uh, we prefer TLS version 1.2. We do not support any earlier version of TLS or SSL because uh, they're vulnerable. Um, over an unreliable connection, uh, we support DTLS or TCP tunneling over UDP, for example. We use asymmetric uh, cryptography with a public key infrastructure. The uh, scope of the public key infrastructure is outside of the scope of the RBI project. Uh, but one of the, the assumptions that we make uh, in this project is that it is possible for a provisioning server to be a trusted route uh, that is available to uh, provision uh, certificates both for a device and uh, to make certificates available uh, to like a mobile device and to a vehicle. Uh, we also assume that that provisioning server uh, has the ability to create uh, JSON web tokens, which is how those uh, self-carried credentials are generated. Uh, do I have a slide in here? That, yeah, okay. So we've got a little bit about uh, authorization in here. Uh, how many of you have heard of JSON web tokens before? Okay, so for those of you who aren't familiar with it, a JSON web token is a JSON structure. Uh, it's when you have a signed version of it, it looks like a, a base64 encoded string. Uh, it's got three parts separated by a period. Mostly looks like garbage. Uh, if you have the public key of the signing authority, then uh, you can check the signature on it. And of course, even if you don't have the, the public key, you can uh, base64 decode the header and the body to see what the contents are. You just don't know whether the contents have been tampered with by some other authority. We use JSON web tokens along with data link encryption to ensure that even if there's a, some sophisticated TLS man in the middle attack, for example, uh, then the access control uh, is still, uh, still relies on that original uh, root of trust. The credential will contain information like uh, the device's own X509 certificate signed by the trusted root. So this is uh, the information that proves that the device really is who it says it is. So if I'm a bad actor and I steal your F-type's uh, credential then and modify it so that it's using my device certificate and then try to send it along to your F-type to try to steal your F-type, then it's not going to work because your F-type will have a different uh, uh, certificate to use in the TLS uh, upgrade. Uh, the or original signing, uh, the original provisioning for the certificate and the credential are handled out of band of the RVI protocol. Uh, it would uh, generally be expected off the assembly line, uh, when initializing uh, a, an app on your mobile phone, something, something out of band of your standard usage. We've also defined a protocol uh, that I have in our supplemental slides for dynamically provisioning. And the way this procedure works, um, we have a guest device uh, that creates its certificate signing request. It does, it does its initial uh, provisioning that you might expect, uh, creating a public-private key pair, creating the certificate signing request, sending that certificate signing request along to the, the provisioning authority to get uh, a signed certificate back. It will also get a credential, a basic credential, uh, authorizing it to use an internal RVI service uh, to get additional credentials. And so then when it connects to a car, uh, on that car, it can invoke the internal RVI service to get additional credentials. And if uh, a user space application that a driver interacts with uh, 
grants additional permissions to unlock the vehicle, for example, or to control the media player, or uh, control the HVAC settings, then that vehicle would act as an intermediate certificate authority and create uh, a new set of credentials for that device that just connected. And because of the, the two-step uh, authentication, uh, the multiple steps involved on both ends of the device, we expect it to be uh, difficult to compromise uh, in much the same way that a paired Bluetooth connection is difficult to compromise. Do I have any other questions so far? How do we prevent replay attacks? How do we prevent replay attacks? Uh, the uh, major one, of course, uh, using TLS, uh, we can uh, re uh, re reduce the, the possibility of replay attacks. We also have uh, in the specification a uh, transaction ID in every message. And so if uh, the transaction ID is uh, lower than the last known good transaction ID, we can discard the message. Uh, it depends on the, uh, the specific implementation choice of uh, the uh, system administrator setting up RVI, uh, but it is our recommendation that you do. So if I were an evil guy and I set up my own, I spoofed my own base station, mm -hmm. and I managed to convince your website to associate a cellular connection, and then I could do a TLS minimum and minimum because I own the base station, what would, is your only last security barrier the, 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 the web token on the transaction? Yeah, so the question was, uh, if I set up a malicious base station and I'm able to do a TLS man in the middle attack, is the final, uh, the final piece of authentication these uh, JSON web tokens? And yes, this is part of our uh, defense in depth strategy. Uh, a TLS uh, man in the middle connection, uh, in many cases uh, for uh, remote vehicle interaction. We're not really seeing other strategies to prevent the prevent anything beyond that. What we're doing with this is that uh, the credential, uh, if it is not signed by a trusted uh, provisioning server, uh, if it doesn't have the the correct uh, uh, signature on it, then we completely reject. Uh, anything and we the vehicle the remote device won't even expose any of the services that it has available on it does that answer your question What's the, lifetime of the, certificate? the lifetime of the certificate is uh, again an implementation detail that we don't define in the specification we recommend short-lived certificates Do I have any other questions before uh, moving on to the next slide? All right. So, uh, like I said, uh, we have, ah, uh, for what's next for RVI, we are currently undergoing a Geneva compliance review. We've also been uh, undergoing a security audit with the Geneva security team. Uh, the security audit report, I believe, is uh, being released soon, but that may be an internal Geneva uh, release. I'm not sure about that. We are continuing to work and extend, the mature, extend and mature our proof of concepts, and uh, to, uh, we are working to get to the maturity level of having a reference implementation that we integrate into the baseline for Geneva, uh, for uh, future Geneva releases. We're also participating in a Geneva sponsored project to field test RVI. It's called a smart city pi pilot. We're working with the city of Las Vegas uh, with the, uh, with sensor networks, traffic data, 
and uh, we're doing a test on uh, how drivers respond to driver notifications for uh, high-risk pedestrian areas. Uh, we have a variety of big data demos, uh, and we're working on IoT integration. Uh, as I said, we have uh, been speaking with uh, the Open Connectivity Foundation at, uh, the, at CES. Geneva and OCF did a joint demonstration uh, on an F-type that actually sits about 20 feet away from my desk most of the time. Uh, we uh, have... Uh, we have all of our uh, GitHub repos, uh, and I've got links right up here. Uh, most of our proof of concepts we wind up uh, doing with a Raspberry Pi or a development Android. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of options. Uh, the Erlang proof of concept uh, is the most, has the most features available to it. Uh, the C proof of concept is the proof of concept that we're, we're working most closely on uh, maturity. We also have the RVI, the Android and the iOS uh, SDKs. And uh, we are current, we, we do have uh, demo projects that are available both on GitHub and it's something that we're actively using uh, with our team in the office. And then all of the Geneva project information is right here at projects.genevi.org. Uh, I do have a little bit of recommended reading on automotive security. Uh, like I mentioned, Craig Smith's Car Hacker's Handbook. Uh, the Miller and Balasek uh, white paper is just titled Remote Car Hacking or remote exploitation of an unaltered passenger vehicle. And then a group of security researchers also based here in Portland with the company Galois uh, did a, a paper and a presentation at the SCAR conference in 2016. So SCAR is embedded security for the car. Uh, that paper is also available for free online. Uh, I'm always looking for new recommendations on security-related reading. Also, how many of you heard uh, Google's announcement, Google security team's announcement today of the first known SHA-1 collision? Good. So I see a hand there. The terrifying paper of, from the University of Washington is an excellent paper, and I also recommend reading it. Uh, one of the, the first papers on uh, automotive security that I read, uh, even before the, the Miller and Valasek paper, was, uh, w I think it may actually have been that University of Washington paper. Uh, it was talking about radio as an attack surface. Because uh, radio signals are just data. They're interpreted by a computer in your car. RDS I data is turned into a stream that's used to display the information, station identifier, maybe the song if the, the data is high enough quality. That's an attack surface. Yes, so yes, so repeating that for the, the video, uh, the important idea is to isolate concerns uh, and to assume that you will be attacked. So uh, we in the, the RBI team are certainly assuming that the vehicle is operating in a malicious world and that we will be attacked. It will probably be often. It will definitely be, as some of those attacks will definitely be by people who have some amount of resources behind them. And so uh, isolation is very important. There is, at the same time, a competing pressure inside the automotive industry to integrate concerns because, of course, why wouldn't, like with all of the, the smart home controls, why wouldn't you want to be able to control all of your HVAC settings in your car? Or uh, have your car recognize you when you, maybe even before you get into the car 
and make it just the way you like it. How many of you uh, share a car or uh, maybe use car rentals or car sharing services? I do, and it's so annoying every time I get in to have to readjust the seat and readjust the mirrors and figure out what radio station I'm on. So like, there's certainly, there's certainly the motivation to integrate these concerns. But there is also a very real security consideration because, quite frankly, getting control of the radio, uh, which is what Miller and Balasek were originally trying to do, they were just trying to control the entertainment system, should not give you control of safety critical systems. If you're, if you're operating under the assumption that some parts of your system are not high assurance, then you'd better make sure that they're not high assurance. Yes? So I was going to ask exactly about that in terms of because they got access to the grid. Yes. Now, is there no separation? I, I don't know the economics of cars, so what's you know, accessible from the scan bus to the other bus, et cetera. But I would have thought that there would be a separation between the critical systems of the car, which actually deal with operation control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question, uh, to repeat it, was, uh, was there no separation of concerns between the IVI system and the cr safety critical systems in uh, this particular line of vehicles, and why not? And the answer is, clearly, there was not enough separation. Uh, internal, the, the car's internal network uh, often all operates on a, a may operate on a single bus. It's not always the case. Every different manufacturer has different software architecture that they put in place and different physical and, and different hardware architecture as well. Um, one reason that it may have happened in this case is because with so many components on board uh, a vehicle, you, have, you run into very real uh, sa space considerations and weight and cost considerations. And so uh, for people who are accustomed to developing in an environment where an air gap is sufficient to enforce security, there's no, there's a very, very small threat uh, to uh, having the IVI and safety critical systems uh, being able to communicate with each other. And there are some, there are some advantages. Uh, if, uh, if the brakes are depressed very, very quickly, uh, that might indicate an accident. If the airbag is deployed, that might indicate an accident. And so you might want to have the, the car, the doors, unlocked automatically so that uh, you don't have somebody uh, trapped uh, in a panicky situation where they're trying to unlock the doors. And at the same time, uh, we, we all know that there is a motivation to have uh, a remote key unlock uh, or a mobile, mobile device unlock. And so already with, with just that combination of considerations, you get this motivation for some form of inter-process communication. I think uh, modern vehicle architectures or uh, post Miller and Balasek exploit uh, vehicles, I think every architect in the automotive world is thinking about that separation of concerns and thinking about how to enforce access control. But ultimately, these are very complex systems that are com composed of a lot of proprietary parts. and. The major uh, focus of OEMs is not on software development expertise. Uh, at best, most OEMs mu have uh, expertise as integrators of solutions that are provided to them by third party vendors. Uh, and the fact that we have so many platforms, so many complicated architectures out there is a big motivation behind what Genevi is working to do in providing baselines and also in what automotive grade Linux is uh, working to do in providing uh, an embedded Linux distribution that can serve as the foundation uh, for an IVI system. 
looks like uh, looks like I've got some more time, about five more minutes for questions. So does anybody else have any questions? Yes. So we used to drive cars that were very manual. Um, they were a little more difficult to drive, but they weren't really hackable. And so here we are going into a place and time where just for convenience, we're giving ourselves an opportunity to get killed. Does that make sense and should we be doing that? OK, so the question is, uh, we used to drive cars that were very manual, didn't have a lot of software components, if any software components. Uh, and so uh, it was pretty hard or impossible to hack those things. And the question is, uh, we're giving ourselves an opportunity to be killed for the sake of convenience. Should we do that? And as a counterpoint, I will offer you that that is what driving is. <laughs> Uh, yes. My answer to that would be how many people die today in the street for human uh, errors. So, you know, looking at this from the hackable point of view, I think it's not fair. Uh, the, the number one reason for, for going this approach is not just to sell more cars, to make sure that people don't get killed for stupid reasons. Hackers will always be there. Yeah. I think, I think that's a really excellent point. We have a gentleman over here who has his hand raised for a question. So I think uh, both from your point of view and from your point of view, those are some really excellent points uh, for motivating software and connected software in vehicles that go beyond my flip point about driving. But I think my flip point about driving still stands. Uh, so uh, one thing that I want to add is that uh, we have even, even in passenger vehicles, you're talking about uh, commercial vehicles uh, offering safety features uh, through uh, fleet management software, <laughs> weight management software that do have to con connect to a backend server somehow. Uh, we also have a lot of cases of passenger vehicles uh, and aftermarket modifications of passenger vehicles that do improve safety. And some of those are, uh, are modules that stay entirely on the car. And some of those are modules that uh, stay completely off, uh, that do connect to a remote, uh, remote service. 
And to your point about uh, stealing cars and manual cars, uh, my first car was a 95 Honda Accord. It was a stick transmission. Love that car. I still miss it. Uh, my stepdad used to drive Toyotas. How many of you are familiar with the whole Toyota or the Subaru keying issue? where there were only so many different kinds of keys that were made. So about one in, I think it was about one in 1,000 vehicles were duplicated. One in 100. So even worse than I thought. So uh, the mobile unlock might sound mostly like a matter of convenience, but there are actually some, some good examples of physical considerations uh, and uh, trade-offs that can be made that software can enable and possibly uh, make the property or uh, lives safer for people in the automotive world. Uh, let's see. I think I need to get out of here to let the next speaker talk. However, uh, I've got some contact information right up here. Uh, if you'd like to talk to me af uh, just outside, I'd be happy to, to chat some more. Thank you very much for coming here today.